Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Johanna Henderson, and I'm the Communications Manager here at BC Healthy Communities. And I'm joining you today here from Victoria, which is on the territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. And I'll do more of a land acknowledgement in a second, but right now it would be great as we wait for all our folks to arrive. Um, if you could just use the chat function here in Zoom to introduce yourself and maybe mention the territory you're joining us from uh, today, if you know it. And uh, we have a few folks on our team here today with me. We've got uh, Jacob, who is, uh, let me see, we've got a, a note. Thank you, Claire. Yes, we were going to mention that. So, um, if you want to talk in the chat, um, definitely click on the send chat to button and click panelists and attendees to make sure that everybody can see what you have to say unless you do intend to speak only to the panelists, which is all the fun. So yeah, from our team, we have uh, Jacob who is going to be in the chat dropping links. Um, and we have Emily, who's going to be doing some tech support, Yvonne, who's in the background running the slides, and uh, Kelly and Lindsay, who are providing general support for us here. There are grad students with us here for about, um, about another month. So, yeah. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Claire. So thank you for all those intros in the chat and keep them coming as we get started. It's nice to see so many people and um, so many people from BC and actually looking at the attendee list, so many people from across the continent today. So as I mentioned above, um, oh, we should move to the next slide. And we'll move to the next slide. So as I mentioned above, uh, BCHC's offices are located on the unceded and traditional territories of the Lekwungen speaking people, specifically the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. But actually, due to the nature of remote work, we have folks on our team today joining us from uh, the traditional and treaty territory of the Mississaugas and Chippewas of the Anishinaabeg, which are known today as the Williams Treaties First Nations. Um, from Pomo and Miwok territory and uh, the traditional unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Uh, so we acknowledge this territory as a reminder of discriminatory, discriminatory racist and colonial practices which have a lasting legacy and continue to create barriers for Indigenous people and communities across the province. Next slide, Yvonne. Okay, so today I will briefly go through uh, a little elevator pitch about BCHC and Plan H, then I will begin speaking um, about this series and a little bit about the public policy. Obviously, it's a huge topic and we're not going to get in and out of it today. Uh, then uh, Anastasia from the Campaign for uh, Living Wage BC will be joining us to speak about living wage policies. We'll follow that up with a case study from the city of Victoria um, with Jody Jensen, and then we'll do some questions, a wrap, and we will uh, split into breakout groups. So just a reminder that this um, will be recorded. It'll be up on our YouTube channel uh, at the BCHC just a few hours after we finish up here. If you can think of anyone on your team or another link who's not here today who might like to see this discussion, we'll be sending a follow-up email either this afternoon or tomorrow with that link so that you can pass that recording on to them. And just to clarify, the breakout rooms will not be recorded. Um, yes, and, and as you see there, we have the hashtag HPP Living Wage. You can follow along with that hashtag on Twitter or tweet using that hashtag. Uh, we'll be live tweeting some of the highlights of the webinar as we go along, so you can also use that hashtag later as an archive of some of the top learnings from today's presentation. And so, um, 
during today's session, our uh, planner Jacob will be in the chat. So you've probably already seen him. Uh, if there's a bit of a conversation going on, he might be chiming in with links or resources. And if you have any specific questions, um, there is a Q&A. We would love it if you would use that just so we make sure to get to all of them. And if you can enter your questions there, we will um, look at them at the end and hopefully uh, be able to provide you with the most fulsome answer possible. And there's also a, an option there to ask questions anonymously if that's something that you'd prefer. Next slide, Yvonne. Just going to spend three seconds talking about BC Healthy Communities and our Plan H program. Uh, we're a nonprofit team who works uh, with and for communities, including local and indigenous governments, to create communities where it's just easier for people to be healthy and well. And to do that, we practice an approach that combines planning and public health. And as you can imagine, uh, to do that requires a fundamental focus on equity. So that's ensuring systemic disadvantages don't get in the way of community members' aspirations for their lives. Next slide, Yvonne. And the Getting Healthy Public Policy Speaker Series is part of our Plan H program, which is a partnership with the Ministry of Health, supporting local government engagement and partnerships to create healthy communities. Next slide, Devon. Thank you. Um, so before we dive into living wage itself, I want to spend about 90 seconds talking about healthy public policy and its role in local governments. So Plan H is focusing on healthy public policy this year because it's really just such a powerful tool for local and indigenous governments to create the conditions for thriving, equitable communities and ultimately to improve the lives of community members. And perhaps what's most exciting about it is that it's a clear pathway to creating a systemic change that, that we're going to need uh, in order to overcome the current challenges we face, such as poverty, housing affordability, uh, and climate change. So this looks a little intimidating, but bear with me uh, for a sec. When we look who is being most impacted by these type of issues, housing affordability, climate change, we know that certain social and economic factors such as racism, sexism, low income level or precarious, for example, well, those determine not just who impacted, but how much they are impacted. And in public health, they refer to those factors as the social determinant of health. Um, Jacob is going to put a little link in the chat uh, to the Canadian Public Health Association's definition of the social determinants of health if you want to learn more about that. But through public policy development and analysis, um, it's, it's an enormous and complex topic, but through it, if we can tackle one small but vital part um, just in the next 30 seconds, it's Building an equity lens is crucial, not just as you develop your policy, so through your process and how you make decisions, how you design your engagement, but it's actually crucial as you decide what the benefits of a policy should look like as they're meted out across a population. So this here uh, shows the existing health and social uh, gradient which indicates that as your social socioeconomic status is higher, uh, you have better health and well-being. And this is, this is true. This is uh, not a controversial concept. It's, it's quite a step. Um, and what we try to do is if you look at these green arrows, um, they identify the amount of support or resources that a group or an individual would get from a policy. So as you can see, the people on the lower end of that graph uh, would use more support to get to health and social gradient that's more even for more people. So when you use an equity lens in thinking about who's going to benefit most from your public policies, uh, we're trying to make that health and social gradient more even by proportionately applying resources based on the need in order to get that more balanced line. And so some of you might have heard this approach uh, referred to as proportionate universalism. And if you are interested in it, I would start with that term as, as a place to Google. But I'll be continuing to explore this topic over the remainder of 2021. And we will be talking 
more, a lot more about HVP through an equity lens, uh, through speakers in this series, through blog articles and through the resources we share. So I encourage you to make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter at uh, planh.ca slash subscribe. So Jacob will put that in the chat. So you can do that. Next slide, Yvonne. All right, enough from me. Uh, we will get to our speakers now. Uh, first step will be Anastasia French, the campaigns and operations organizer for the Living Wage for Families campaign. Uh, Anastasia has worked for over 10 years campaigning on social justice issues in Canada and the UK, joining the Living Wage for Families campaign in June 2020. Since then, she's managed to grow that number of living wage employers by a third in less than a year. Uh, she previously worked as a campaigns manager for the Children's Society, one of Britain's top children's charities, leading successful campaigns on issues around debt, child poverty, and support for refugee and my children. And her role currently is split between the Living Wage for Families campaign and supporting First Call BC Child and Youth Advocacy Coalition. And then after that, we'll have Jody Jensen, Head of Human Resources at the City of Victoria. She joined the city uh, as the Head of Human Resources in 2017, and she brings more than 20 years of leadership experience in human resources and operational roles. And prior to that, she worked in a variety of roles with the Provincial Health Services Authority, and most recently as COO for BC Emergency Health Services. Jody holds a BSc from UVic and an MA from SFU. So with that, uh, I will hand it off to you, Anastasia. Hi everyone, um, I'm Anastasia. I'm the campaign organizer for the Living Wage for Families campaign. I'm um, zooming in from the unceded and stolen territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh communities. And I am very much a settler on this land and I'm very grateful to be here. Um, next slide. Um, so first of all, what is a living wage? Um, a living wage is the hourly amount that a family needs to be able to afford basic essentials. We partner with community groups across the province to calculate the living wage um, for those communities because some places the housing is more expensive, other places childcare is more expensive, so we try and really get the calculation for, um, for that community. And that, um, that calculation is based on the really basic essentials that a family needs, so food, clothing, shelter, transportation, childcare, um, and is, is very much a bare bones calculation. Um, the living wage for Metro Vancouver is $19.50 an hour, and for Greater Victoria, which Jody will be talking about, is $19.39 an hour. I think it's worth, um, for those people who might not know the difference between the minimum wage and the living wage, um, the minimum wage is the minimum you need to pay your employees, otherwise you're breaking the law. <laughs> the minimum wage in um, British Columbia is $15.20 an hour. And as you can see from all of our calculations, every single community is more expensive to live in um, than, um, than, than if, ever, if, some, if both parents were working full time earning minimum wage, they wouldn't be earning enough to be able to make ends meet. Um, so a living wage is the opportunity for employers to do more, to kind of step up and make sure that their staff are looked after and their staff um, don't need to stress about whether or not they can afford housing or childcare because they'll be earning um, at the very least a living wage. Next slide. Um, so we at the Living Wage for Families campaign, we, we kind of have three main functions. Uh, we calculate the living wage for communities across British Columbia. So the calculations you saw on the previous slide, um, they were done most recently in 2019. So we'll be refreshing the calculations in November. So we'll have to see what happens there. Um, we certify those employers who commit to pay their staff and contracted workers a living wage. Um, and we'll be hearing from one of those in a bit, which is Jodie. Um, and we advocate for government policies that help families make ends meet. So anything that will lower the cost of living for families um, we, we campaign for. So interestingly, in 2019, the living wage decreased across the province because investments in childcare and investments in um, child opportunity benefit made life slightly more affordable for families, um, which meant which offset some of the costs um, of increased housing and um, other, other costs had gone up um, because of government investments. Actually, for families with children, life got slightly more affordable. Um, next slide. So this is Caroline's story, and this is um, this is why it's important to earn a living wage. So she lives on Vancouver Island. She's been working for her living wage employer since June last year. But before she worked for her living wage employer, she was she was basically just earning minimum wage, and life was really difficult. Um, she was having to work multiple jobs to make ends meet. She was always stressed, always worried that was impacting on her physical health and her mental health. Um, and earning a living wage meant that she could choose to look. She could invest in her health. It meant she could go to, go 
to the dentist to buy a winter jacket, which in Canada is, is important, maybe less so in weather like this, which is really sunny, um, and buy healthier groceries. Um, but for Caroline, actually, the biggest difference that earning a living wage has meant has been has been on her independence. And this quote there is genuinely from, from her mouth and once I've heard from, from many, many women who are now earning a living wage is that she no longer has to cozy up in relationships that she doesn't want to be in. She doesn't have to get men to buy her drinks and she can choose to be independent and make decisions for herself. And so that's why kind of earning a living wage is really important from, from an employee perspective and from a kind of um, a moral perspective. But next slide. We also know that actually uh, paying a living wage is good for employers. 93% um, of living wage employees in the UK have found a benefit to joining the programme. There's lower staff turnover, lower retraining costs, lower absenteeism, um, improved staff performance, improved morale, improved productivity, more focused staff and, and increased reputation and profile because people know that you're an organisation that cares about your community and wants to make sure that your staff are taken care of. Next slide. And finally, the benefit is for communities. I mean, the reason that we started the campaign in the first place is because we know that the majority of people in BC who are living in poverty are working. They're working really, really hard to try and take care of their families. Um, uh, but they're, they're, not, they're not earning enough money um, to be able to fully make ends meet, which is where the kind of the idea for a living wage campaign came from. And so those employers that commit to pay their staff and contracted workers a living wage, there's then a ripple effect through supply chains. Um, we are seeing 20% of new employers are coming from living wage municipalities, and they know that if they want to do business with a municipality, they've got to make sure that their staff are earning a living wage. And then when those staff are earning a living wage, they're far more likely to spend money within their local community. Research has shown that those with lower incomes tend to spend more of their money and tend to spend it locally. So when they get a pay rise, or a pay increase, that money is then invested in local businesses compared to when people on higher incomes get a pay increase that money is often invested in um maybe in stocks and shares and offshore and maybe on international holidays and things that are not within that local community whereas when people on lower incomes get a raise that money then goes straight back into that local community and it kind of it then creates a positive impact on the other side of it though for those people when people are not earning a living wage working poverty has enormous fiscal implications for social programs healthcare costs education crime employment all of these things it's often local communities that have to pick up the price and um and try and and spend money to try and address these issues so we, we very much firmly believe that living wage is one clear solution to help kind of address a lot of the problems associated with poverty in bc next slide so we have over 250 living wage employers across the province. I, the number has, has shot up recently, and I'm really, really happy to see that. We have 11 local government and public bodies. You can see their logos there, one of whom is the city of Victoria. And Jodie will talk about how she implemented the policy at the city. Um, but we also have living wage employers across a whole range of spectrums from um, breweries to vending machine makers to um, yoga studios. It's a real kind of broad mix of those employers that have come on board and want to make sure that their staff are looked after. We've also got quite a spread across the province. The table on the left shows um, the different communities that we are that we have li certified living wage employers in. Um, you can see that there is a higher concentration in Metro Vancouver and Greater Victoria, but I'm really keen to try and grow that number locally across the province in other communities. Next slide. Um, and we've really seen during the pandemic, I mean, the pandemic has, has changed all of us, but we've seen that the people who have paid the highest price are those on the lowest incomes. Uh, many of BC's lowest paid workers have been the ones that are on the front line keeping us safe, keeping us fed, keeping us cared for. Unfortunately, that also means that they're then more at risk of getting COVID. Um, we've seen that COVID-19 disproportionately affects people living in poverty. That might be because they're working multiple jobs to make ends meet. And so that's multiple touch points for potentially contracting and spreading the virus. It's because they're living in overcrowded housing because they can't afford to live, um, live independently. And so they're living in overcrowded housing. And again, that's more touch points for the virus. They're unable to take time off ill because there's no paid sick leave scheme. Um, and at the same time, we've also seen a growth in public support and understanding of the vital work that low paid workers have done and are doing. Um, and I really hope this is this is one positive legacy that comes out of this pandemic is the vital people appreciating the work that people in grocery stores, cleaners, security guards, work that I think previously had been a bit overlooked, um, the value of that work for us as a society and without that work, we, the society doesn't function. Um, we saw early on, um, I think one really example of how COVID-19 kind of being spread early on, uh, very early on in the pandemic, I think March, February last year, um, it was being spread in long-term care homes where healthcare workers who were earning 
just uh, they were not earning very much money whatsoever were having to work in multiple care homes multiple jobs to make ends meet and bonnie henry um put in the single site order which meant that they that workers were only to work on one site so that lessens their uh, chance of, of spreading the virus but also wages were brought up so that they they didn't have to suffer a financial consequence for this and i think that's one real like, clear example of how uh, links between low wage work and um and uh, covid-19 being spread next slide but we've also seen that for employers, I mean, it's been such a difficult time for so many businesses and organizations over the past year. Um, many have had to close their doors, not knowing when they're going to reopen again. Um, and it's been really stressful and really difficult for many employers. So much so that we thought now we did think a, a year ago, now isn't really the right time to be talking about living wages when with all the best will in the world, some employers are struggling to pay any wage whatsoever. However, I know now from having spoken to so many employers that when they shut their doors and they were looking at their reopening plans, front and center of their reopening plans was how do we keep our staff safe and how do we make sure they're engaged because without our staff engaged, this reopening plan isn't gonna work. Um, and I think that's why as a result, so many employers have come on board and are now contacting and doing outreach and wanna make sure that they're paying their staff a living wage. Um, we've seen a 400% increase in inquiries and applications from living wage employers. Um, prior to the pandemic, we certified about 30 living wage employers a year. This year already between January and May, we've certified 50. So that's nearly twice as many as we would get in a whole year prior to the pandemic. Um, and 20% uh, of applications, as I mentioned earlier, are from um, employers that want to do business with other living wage employers. Um, and so they they might have seen it in an RFP proposal. They might have seen it on their on their website or something. And they know that actually it does better business for them if they're paying their staff a living wage. Next slide. And so this is the campaign today. We've got 251 living wage employers. Nearly 30,000 people work for living wage organisations. There are 11 living wage local governments. I'm hoping very soon uh, the city of Langley and the city of North Vancouver will join that list um, and um, keen to grow that outside. We've got loads in the lower mainland and um, in the greater Victoria area, and I'm keen to grow that outside the province and in other, in other places. We've already certified 50 this year. Um, and you can see there that our largest living wage employers, over half of them are municipalities. And so so that's one really key point of the campaign is that we're trying to focus on. Next slide. And what we really want to do, and I'm happy to, to reach out to any anyone who's listening who thinks they want to be involved more, um, my email address will be on the next slide. Please do get in touch. We're really keen to partner with community groups to um, help calculate living wage rates. You might have been looking and seeing that your community isn't on that map. Let's get it added. Um, and we're actually looking at the moment for, uh, we're in the, in the process right now of um, planning our calculations for this year. So now is exactly the right time to get in touch. Um, we, but also we want to work with communities to raise awareness of the importance of a living wage, grow the number of living wage employers within communities, um, campaign for municipalities and other local governments to join the living wage campaign, um, and also to hear from you in the, the unique situation in your community. For example, we know that um, in Revelstoke and Tofino and tourist towns, housing, the cost of housing is a real issue compared to other parts of the province, um, but we're keen to also just learn more about your community and the kind of unique insights. So. Um, if you if you do want to if you if you wanted to continue to get involved please do get in touch with me and we can talk about how we can make it work for your community next slide so yeah thank you very much there's my contact details I, i'm sure they're going to be shared anyway um or if you just go onto the living wage for families website my email address is there as well so thank you very much and what i'm going to do is i'm going to lead you on to jody now and jody um led the the implementation plan at the city of victoria and um is an expert in very much everything that living wage means for um, municipalities and the employers themselves. So thank you very much. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, appreciate that introduction. Um, my name is Jody Jensen. I'm uh, head of human resources for the city of Victoria, and uh, I'm grateful to be speaking to you today from Lekwungen territory, uh, the homelands of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. Um, I could I have the next slide, please. Uh, I want to begin just by providing a bit of context about why becoming a living wage employer is important for the city of Victoria. Uh, many folks know that uh, Victoria is the capital city and uh, we are also an economic and cultural hub for the region. Uh, but at about 85,000 residents, we're a relatively minor or sort of, I should say, mid-sized municipality, um, making up just 22% of the region's population. And Victoria residents have lower median incomes and fewer households in higher income brackets. 
Um, so you can see from the figures here that the median household income uh, is about $16,000 a year lower than that uh, for other households in the region. And four in 10 households uh, in Victoria have uh, with children are lone parent families uh, compared with three in 10 regionally. Uh, in addition to income, I just want to highlight housing affordability, uh, which is a significant issue uh, within our municipality. Approximately 60% of Victoria households rent their homes compared to 34% regionally, and their median income is just over half that of owner households. 13% uh, of renter households, and that represents almost 3,600 households in this municipality, uh, live in subsidized housing or receive a rent sub supplement. Um, could I have the next slide, please? So uh, City of Victoria's Council uh, adopted a strategic plan which has eight uh, strategic objectives, uh, which you can see here on the screen. And becoming a living wage employer is linked to many of these objectives, um, such as prosperity and economic inclusion, health, well-being, and a welcoming city, and strong livable neighborhoods. Um, and uh, if I could have the next slide. Uh, the plan uh, defines desired outcomes under each objective, uh, including that people who work in Victoria can afford to live in Victoria, uh, that employers can find enough qualified workers to fill the available jobs that they have, and fewer people are living below the poverty line and more people have access to a living wage. Um, so certification was set as a goal, uh, which was achieved in January 2020. Uh, due to the pandemic, our recognition of that um, achievement was a bit delayed, but you can see uh, in the photo here in the background, uh, just uh, our mayor and council uh, with their official plaque certifying them as a, as a living wage employer. Have the next slide, please. Uh, Victoria's Council has also uh, formally committed to the development and adoption of an equity lens or equity framework uh, to guide the development of city services and programs. Um, so I, this you know, draws back to what Joanna spoke about previously in terms of understanding um, the different impact of our policy decisions and our programs uh, across uh, folks within our community. Um, so we've recognized that in order to ensure everyone has access to equal benefits and outcomes requires that an intersectional approach to policy development. So that means recognizing that people have multiple and diverse identity factors, such as race or gender or ability, uh, that intersect to shape their perspectives and experiences. The next slide, please. So what's involved in becoming a living wage employer? Um, I want to say that the Living Wage Campaign uh, has a guide for employers on their website and lots of other resources on the website uh, that can be downloaded. It is very helpful to uh, if you're just uh, getting started and uh, understanding what would be required uh, to become a living wage employer. Um, but key to that is uh, the development and uh, submission of an implementation plan along with your application. Uh, that implementation plan must include a timeline uh, by which uh, you are able to bring all of your employees up to a living wage, the timeline by which all the, your contracted or subcontracted labor services uh, will be paid a living wage, and a process for uh, making annual adjustments to the prevailing living wage uh, as it's recalculated by the campaign for your community. There are some exemptions, uh, which I think is important to understand because oftentimes, you know, when we come to implementing, we think about, you know, particular circumstances where uh, a living wage may be difficult. Uh, and um, the campaign has recognized that uh, there's different forms of employment that may be considered differently or exempted from the living wage. And these include casual employment of less than 120 hours per year, perhaps uh, student intern or practicum placements, and social purchasing uh, or social enterprise or small, um, multiple small contracts. Uh, next slide. So these are, you know, in broad strokes, the, the steps that um, we took at the City of Victoria to become a living wage employer and that would apply to most uh, local and Indigenous governments. Um, so the first step was to take a, prepare and take a staff report to our council, which set out the implications of becoming a living wage employer so that they can understand the risks and benefits and also understand the costs associated with it. Um, council uh, also then uh, adopted a living wage policy, uh, recognizing that paying a living wage constitutes a critical investment in the long-term prosperity of our community, contributes to economic inclusion, and fosters a dedicated, skilled, and healthy workforce. Uh, we then uh, worked uh, to amend our procurement policy to be consistent with our living wage policy. 
uh, and provided notice to all of our contracted service providers uh, that uh, uh, that would be a requirement for them uh, in the future when their contract terms came to an end and we went out to retender those, for those services that they would uh, need to meet that requirement if they wish to uh, continue to provide service to the city. Uh, and it also required us to negotiate an agreement uh, with our union, one of our unions, to uh, change our wage schedule. Uh, next slide, please. So before becoming a living wage employer, the city uh, had about 850 FTEs of uh, employees. That's a headcount of about 1,100 uh, when we look at casual or auxiliary employment. Uh, four collective agreements with four different unions. And all of those wage rates were at or above the living wage, except for uh, some seasonal auxiliary positions in our recreation department. Um, so they were on a different wage schedule for some historical reasons, I suppose. These are positions which were traditionally filled by young workers uh, and often by uh, young women. Uh, so some of this work is gendered in nature in terms of uh, child care services. And so uh, we identified that we, there would be uh, about 45 employees uh, who would be uh, impacted by the adoption of a living wage uh, and that the cost for bringing their wages up uh, to the living wage for Victoria would be less than $10,000 a year for us. So fairly small financial impact for a city of our size with a budget of our size, but a significant impact uh, potentially for those 45 uh, folks who uh, would then be able to um, have you know additional income for uh, housing, uh, being able to pay tuition fees or do what else uh, ever it is that they, that they uh, that they require. Um, next slide, please. So these uh, this in terms of uh, uh, making those changes for employees, uh, we provided notice to the union. Uh, we calculated the impact of the non-mandatory benefits on the living wage. So Anastasia spoke uh, earlier about the fact that uh, part of the living wage uh, can uh, take into account any non-mandatory benefits that the employer pays. Um, so our auxiliary staff, for example, are paid a percentage in lieu of benefits uh, that are represented in the collective agreement. Some of those are considered mandatory. So those are benefits uh, provided for under employment standards legislation. Uh, but other of those benefits are uh, considered non-mandatory in the sense that they're negotiated through a collective agreement and they're not a stop in legislation. So we had to sort of tease that apart and figure out what the value of uh, that benefit package was or that payment in lieu of those benefits, uh, and then uh, determine uh, based on that figure uh, what the living wage uh, should be for our employees. Uh, we then met with our union, in this case, uh, QP Local 50, we partnered with on this exercise to uh, negotiate a formal letter of agreement to amend our wage schedules. Uh, and we looked at timing and the process for which that would be reviewed in the future. Uh, and that, of course, then had to be ratified uh, both by our council and as well by uh, the QP executive according to their constitutional processes. So, uh, and then from there, we were able to notify our employees and implement the change. And um, of course, this is one which was uh, a good news notification and, um, and uh, we were able to go ahead uh, and make a difference for those employees. Next slide. Uh, for contracted services, a little bit more complicated. Um, now, our living wage policy applies to all contracts where services are provided on a regular ongoing basis, and the contractor is expected to perform more than 120 hours of work per year for us. Uh, and the estimated annual value of the contract is greater than 0.5% of the city's total purchasing budget. Um, so sometimes that can be difficult to figure out, you know, what is our total purchasing budget, depending on how budgets are arranged within your particular uh, organization or municipality. Um, but that was, uh, that's uh, the, the requirement in our policy. Uh, we did a review of all of our contracts and we identified that there were fewer than 10 uh, that would be impacted by the adoption of a living wage. So there's a couple of reasons for this. You know, primarily this is because uh, the city of Victoria has what we call uh, an equal wage provision in all of our collective agreements. And what that means is that we've agreed with our unions that when we contract out for services uh, for work, uh, which is gonna be performed, which is the same or similar to work performed by city employees, uh, that we have committed that we will require those um, employers that we're contracting with to pay their staff at a minimum 
uh, the rates of pay that are in our collective agreements. So that essentially means we are not contracting out in order to save money on labor costs. Uh, we are contracting out uh, for other reasons, which may have to do with capacity or a specialized service. So for that reason, um, the majority of uh, our contract arrangements are already at uh, or above the prevailing living wage. Uh, in addition, the city had already incorporated social procurement uh, into our purchasing policy, uh, which allows us to make purchasing decisions that focused on the best value for community rather than only on the lowest price. So that means that when we evaluate bids or proposals, we're not just looking at cost, uh, we can establish a set of criteria that consider greater community outcomes, making it easier for smaller and medium sized businesses to benefit from the economic opportunities created through government contracts. So the funds spent on improving communities delivered through procurement creates this local economic development, local employment, increased affordability, and greater access to services. So as part of implementing our living wage policy, uh, we amended our procurement policy and we now incorporate living wage clauses into all competitions and contracts. Uh, we notify all, we notified all our current contractors of the living wage requirement upon uh, renewal or retender. And uh, we also issue all RFPs and RFOs with the living wage policy as an appendix. Next slide. So if you're considering becoming a living wage employer, some of the um, you know, biggest impact, I think, given the level of unionization of our employees and for most folks uh, across the sector, um, you know, the biggest impact is really downstream in community um, through procurement. Um, this may result in increased costs for some contracted services, but I, uh, you know, as been mentioned uh, earlier by Anastasia and Joanna, that means that those dollars are typically remaining in our community and increasing the well economic well being of our community. Public sector spending represents a very large portion of Vancouver Island's economy. And so we recognize that how we spend our funds matters. And social procurement enables local governments to procure goods and services in line with the values of our communities and to the benefit of our local economies, which of course aligns with the objectives of the living wage campaign. And finally, we know that um, becoming a living wage employer has positive impacts on employee engagement and is crucial for organizational performance. So research shows that engaged employees are more productive, are less likely to resign and provide better services. So this applies not only to our direct city employees, uh, but also of course to the employees of companies that provide services to us through contract arrangements. Um, so from the city of Victoria's perspective, becoming a living wage employer therefore contributes positively to sort of quality and value for the services that are being delivered for our community uh, with taxpayer dollars. So uh, with that, I'm going to uh, hand it back to Joanna. Thank you so much, Jody and Anastasia. Uh, that was fantastic. Uh, I feel like we got a ton of overview in a very concise amount of time, which I personally love. But we do have a couple of questions. So if we can move, uh, actually, we don't have to move to the next slide, Yvonne. We can just stop the sharing so we can see our faces. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so we had uh, one question, which I think is more for Anastasia um, from Mark. Health authorities are massive employers and purchase in the millions yearly. Uh, do you have a sense of whether living wage requirements are beginning to be baked into supplier contracting? Um, I haven't yet had any conversations with anyone from any health authorities, but I'm very happy to. So um, if any health authorities do want to get in touch or anything like that about this, I'm really happy to, to do that, to talk about how we can um, grow the number of both direct employees working for health authorities and also those contracted workers. Um, and with, I mean, we've seen in the pandemic, as I said, there's lots of staff who are working um, either directly or indirectly through contracts. Um, and I also don't know with that, how much of that is a bigger conversation with the BC government and the provincial government about those contracts um, and making sure that those staff are earning a living wage. Okay, Jody, did you have anything to add to that or? You know, the city of Victoria works in partnership with um, a lot of local governments on the bank on Vancouver Island um, to, um, to 
to support social procurement and help folks understand, you know, what are the implications of social procurement practices, which I think includes, you know, paying a living wage, right? Um, given, you know, that notion of considering things uh, about, uh, you know, the benefit for local community and, the, and our values um, as employers and, and recognizing, uh, you know, as I spoke before, the incredible influence, you know, that um, governments at all levels have and public sector entities across the province have in, you know, influencing uh, through supply chain, right, those practices among employers. So uh, I know that uh, the city recently uh, received a grant um, to assist with work on expanding uh, social procurement across the province. Uh, you know, taking the great work that's been done uh, in cooperation with other folks on Vancouver Island. And so I think it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see how that might develop over time, but perhaps it's part of a trend. Okay. Um, maybe we'll just stay with Jody for a second with uh, another question, which is, uh, why did the city of Victoria choose this policy over other similar policies? You know, I, I think I've described before that, you know, the, uh, our, our council and our council strategic plan is, um, is, a, is an ambitious strategic plan. And, you know, our council is ambitious in terms of its objectives for um, creating a community which is um, more equitable, uh, which is more inclusive, uh, which has a vibrant and sustainable economy. And, um, you know, becoming a living wage employer uh, was seen as a, a bit of a no brainer in some way in terms of this is an available policy option, which is, um, it's, it's accessible, uh, it's not difficult to implement. And uh, it was something that we were able to do and, uh, and then also uh, work on other initiatives, um, such as, uh, you know, housing affordability, um, been doing some policy work in the last year around uh, rent eviction issues, uh, you know, keeping close tabs on New Westminster uh, and their progress in that area, um, uh, you know, uh, pursuing programs to address uh, in, uh, food security uh, through the pandemic, such as the Get Growing Victoria program. Um, so this is really just, uh, you know, a recognition that there are many, many um, ways uh, to uh, tackle uh, poverty uh, and inequality in our communities. And for the city of Victoria, this was an option which works for us, uh, may not work for everybody, um, but we saw it as simply um, a bit of a no brainer, uh, quite honestly, in terms of uh, being able to um, access this program and, and help to uh, achieve the goals that council set. And then I see another question, which is perhaps more for Anastasia, uh, regarding contractors, calculations, uh, et cetera. Is it possible to negotiate the terms of that with the... With yeah, to, we're, we're always very happy to work with, um, with, with employers to kind of find out what their unique scenarios are and to try and to instruct we try and put some flexibility in the in the scheme so for example the the requirement on it's got to be over 120 hours or 10 hours a month so it's a significant contractor for example is kind of one of our trying to put some flexibility in we do have some kind of some baselines to ensure that um that direct staff are earning a living wage um within six months of employment and stuff like that we've got some kind of fundamentals which we don't kind of change but we are also we know that employers work in different ways and different industries are very different and stuff so we're always keen to work with and listen and try and um, adapt our policies to take into account the individualities of those circumstances while also staying true to our kind of guarantee that uh, and our kind of principles of um, staff and contractors trying to earn a living wage and to lift the number of low-wage workers lift the fat wages of low-wage workers not lifting the number of low-wage workers that's the opposite of what we're trying to do all right um, okay, we have a, another question. Inflation has been fairly stable, uh, but with the increases, the anticipated increases in inflation, oh, that's a good question. How responsive are our living wages programs in Hang On Target? Yeah, so what we, with, with, 
we calculate, as I said, the living wage on an annual basis, although we actually didn't do it last year because COVID threw everything up in the air. Um, and so when the living wage goes up um, or, or even when it goes down, we tell we contact employers and we tell them this is the new living wage rate. And um, and then they have six months to bring staff up to the new living wage rate. And if they can't if they can't do that, then um, we we sort of we, we take them off our website and we sort of uncertify them for the time being, but tell them they're very much willing to and we're welcome to come back on board when they are at a stage where they can pay their staff a living wage again um, and we've actually in the past year had three or four more organizations come on board um, that had previously dropped off um, it will be interesting because i think previously we would lose about one percent every year or so i would say of living wage employers but it'll be interesting now with the rate that we've seen um, and depending on how much the living wage goes up if it's if it's a significant amount or not um whether or not uh, we'll see a, an increased drop off but it's only it's a very small number of um employers can't keep up with it and we we do understand and we try and be as kind of supportive as possible okay because yeah it is a good question it's been on my mind as well seeing a lot about inflation lately in the news um another question that's been asked and again, this is probably more for Anastasia. Do you have examples of small local businesses in rural communities uh, participating in the living wage program? Yeah, it's really interesting just the sheer number of different kind of businesses that have have come on board as living wage employers within within rural areas. We've got um we've got a distillery in the Comox Valley. We've got a cannabis farm on Salt Spring Island. Um, a, a, car and automotive cleaning service um in invermere um also within invermere we've got um a company that makes stickers and beer tap handles um and uh we've just certified our first living wage ski area um so they're kind of they're a small ski area but sovereign lake in vernon um so it is a real variety of businesses and organizations within within rural areas and within urban areas and it's certainly interesting just seeing the sheer variety of employment opportunities that there are in bc Wow, yeah, that is uh, that is quite the spread. Um, yeah, and you had said before, Anastasia, that the um, the program has increased considerably. Did we, I think it was a third over the past year in terms of people who had joined. So that's very exciting. Yeah, we've and then got we have uh, a, a question. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, and it, and that that increases. Oh, okay. I mean, it's predominantly been in the Metro Vancouver area, but I'm keen to try and grow that within small organizations in other parts of British Columbia as well. well that's that's great because uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, smaller governments in BC, and many of them are joining today. So uh, I uh, that those of you who are joining from uh, smaller places are uh, able to get in touch with Anastasia. There's one last question here, and it's for the, the I guess it's for Jody. Um, for the city of Victoria, has implementing a living wage program uh, resulted in any funding, funding decreases uh, to social service programs? So they're giving the example of city grants. Yeah, absolutely not. Um, you know, in fact, over the last year, we've uh, expanded our grant programs, um, you know, to organizations across the community in recognition of the impact of the pandemic. So, um, no, absolutely no uh, decrease uh, in terms of funding for uh, for those uh, those kinds of programs. Short and sweet. But then I remember you saying that um, it, the difference in funding was only was it am I correct it was about ten thousand dollars like it wasn't a huge that's right yeah for our employee group it was uh, about ten thousand dollars a year and in in, uh, in terms of wages uh, for those recreation staff um, you know of course unfortunately employment for that group of staff was impacted through the course of the pandemic with the closure of the crystal pool uh, and other recreation facilities uh, within the municipality but um, for those casual workers but uh, you know uh, we're hopeful that uh, obviously um, we're coming into a different period uh, and uh, hopefully next year the Royal Athletic Park will be reopened. But um, no, the, certainly um, the cost of uh, that, uh, that increase was, uh, you know, from our budget perspective would be considered immaterial. Okay, um, that looks like the end of our questions. So Vaughn, if you want to bring the presentation up again. Into the next slide. Thank you.
So yeah, just to wrap, um, living wages improve a community for everyone. As you've heard uh, through these presentations, they benefit the employee, the employer, and the community. They support access to services that already exist in the community, such as housing, recreation, food, and transportation. Uh, they result in higher quality services that the uh, employer can deliver and actually long-term reduce costs. Uh, and as Jody has uh, kind of laid out for us, they really help advance the community's social equity related goals so they can be a powerful tool for that. And some of the largest employers uh, in communities uh, are local governments. So that uh, gives them an opportunity to be community champions really cause a, a ripple effect local supply chains. And uh, yeah, adopting a living wage policy in your community will be unique but there is support every step of the way. Anastasia has offered her contact information and uh, there are other governments, local governments who are also living wage employers that I'm sure would be open to speaking with you about their experience. Next slide, Avon. So just before we talk about our breakout rooms, uh, a few things you can do right away if you are not going to um, march into a meeting and demand a living wage policy. Um, another good thing to do would be to visit our Healthy Public Policy page on our Plan H website. So we will send these links out with our follow-up email. Um, you are always welcome to speak with our Healthy Community staff about topics including land use and social planning, uh, equitable community engagement design, uh, local economic development and active transportation. We have people who have uh, kind of specialized in all those areas and others. So if there's something you want to talk about uh, in terms of healthy communities and local governments, please reach out to us. All of our emails are just our first name and then at bchealthycommunities.ca. And another thing you can do, you can take the National Collaborating Center for Healthy Public Policies free framework for analyzing public policies course. I've taken this course myself. Uh, it is fantastic uh, and a great introduction if you didn't do a lot of uh, policy analysis in, uh, in any of your kind of school or work experience. It can be a great start. I, I learned so much even from that short course. And then lastly, of course, you can tune in to the next three talks in our series that we'll be carrying out through the rest of the year. Um, we have coming up next, I believe in August, uh, a kind of a deep dive into uh, land acquisition and disposal strategies for creating and uh, supporting affordable housing. Um, so yeah, I see a question there. We will definitely put that uh, that in the follow up email to you. So you don't need to worry about that. But it was the National Collaborating Centers um, for Health and Public Policy Framework for Analyzing Public Policies course. We'll send all this out to you either this afternoon or tomorrow. Uh, next slide, Yvonne. So many of you indicated you were interested in uh, participating in a breakout room just um, to meet and greet other people who are interested in these types of policies. Uh, even if you didn't indicate that you're interested, you are still welcome to join us. We were just doing that to try to get a sense of how many rooms we would need. Um, so what's gonna happen is we're going to end this session and uh, a survey is going to pop up. It's gonna take about five minutes. So I would welcome you to take that survey and then uh, in about five minutes, so at about noon sharp, uh, we, will, we will meet back uh, using this short link, planh.ca slash HPP networking. That will take you to a new Zoom meeting where you can, um, you can, you'll meet me in the main room and I'll put you in one of the breakout rooms. So we'll have a breakout room with uh, Jody and a breakout room with Anastasia. And then in those rooms as well, we'll have a, one planner from our team in each of those rooms. So yeah, I will say farewell for now. Thank you all so much for joining. And uh, those of you who are interested in joining the networking session, hopefully we will see you in about five minutes. So you're welcome to either do the survey, take a bio break, but at noon, we'll see you at planh.ca slash HPP networking. That link will also pop up at the end of the survey. 
Uh, so that's another way to access it and a little incentive for doing the survey. Thanks so much again to our presenters and our team, and we'll see you soon.